Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to get back to that in a minute, but um, just so you know, I, I want to just add to the funny. Steve and I were watching that, and videos cost money like that. You have to buy them. And he's like, we could totally do that for free. <laughs> and I said, yes, in all our free time and our total lack of ability to use computers to edit things. That would have come out fantastic. So... Anyway, um, good morning. I am, for those of you who don't know, I am Katie. Um, I am not Tom. Oh, shocker. <laughs> Nor am I Brent, um, who normally uh, bring the message to you. Uh, Chuck so delightfully pointed out to me this morning, turns out that I am Cardell Jones. I am the third string. <laughs> Which is good because I, he led them to a championship, so hopefully this morning I can lead you somewhere good. Um, we're going to hope for that. Before we go any further, uh, the elders are out of town along with Tom and Jenny. Um, the spouses of the elders, um, our worship leader, our youth leader, um, are all at a retreat this weekend. They didn't all just bail out of town at the same time. Um, they, well, they did, but together. Um, so I want to take a minute and lift them up in prayer. Um, and then we're going to get into our, our message this morning. So if you would pray with me, Father God, Lord, I just want to lift up our leaders, Lord. Um, I just want to pray for them, Lord, that you are moving this weekend for them, that you are giving them guidance, that you are giving them um, your presence is with them, Lord, that they will feel your leading um, and that they come back refreshed and energized and um, just with vision to uh, guide and lead our church in the direction that you want it to go, Lord. I just pray that you take off any of their worldly desires and, and those kinds of things, and they can just really come together as a team and follow you. Um, I lift up each one who's here this morning, Lord, that you might work here too, Lord. We know your presence. We could feel it this morning during worship, and I thank you for that. And I just pray you continue to move here, that um, these words will be your words, Lord, and they will move in these hearts. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, so this morning I have to start with a true confession. I am a wallower. I, I don't know if anybody can identify with that, but I am a wallower. I uh, get upset about things and I just wallow around in it. Like, poor me. Like, this bad thing has happened and... And I, it's bad, and my life is terrible, and I'm miserable, and bad things happen. And I kind of like, I'm a person that kind of like hangs out in that place from time to time. I think we all do, right, at times. Um, so God brought this message to me to talk about what to do when we're wallowing, when we're in that place. So that's what we're going to talk about today, but I want to give it a little bit of context. So how often do we... Um, things are happening in our lives and we kind of like sink down into them. Like I, my vision was, um, I like the word wallowing for some reason this week. I don't know. And I really don't think it's because I'm married to a pig farmer because truth be told, our pigs wallow in nothing. Um, they're quite clean. Uh, but I imagined this kind of mud pit of problems that we kind of like to sink down in and sit in. And we kind of cover ourselves with it. I sort of thought about it like a spa treatment, but then that's bad because <laughs> this is not what we want to be doing. Um, <laughs> that we, things happen to us and we feel like we're stuck in them. And we kind of celebrate the negativity and the self-pity in our lives. Um, you know, this morning was a good example. I'm going to share this and then I'm going to share the end of it. So as I'm walking, okay, so this morning I'm getting ready and God just gave, this is not a story I was going to share, but um, I'm trying to get ready this morning. And first of all, our furnace isn't working. So it's very cold in my house and it's okay because it, nobody needs to offer us a place to live. We're all right. Um, but the furnace is broken and um, so it's cold. So getting out of bed was not really something I wanted to do this morning. And then I said, I'm going to go downstairs and run through the message. And I look up at the clock and it's 8.52 and I wanted to be at church at nine o'clock and I hadn't taken a shower and, or anything. So, um, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm running around. Um, my daughter can't get her contacts in her eyes. And so I'm having to help her do that. That's slowing things down. I'm trying to put these nail wraps on my fingers and that's totally not working. So I have like one pretty hand and one hot mess hand and I'm stressed out. I go, I walk out the door. The kids are everywhere. Thank goodness that Steve is a good dad. But anyway, kids are all over the place. I walk out the door. I literally dropped everything but my coffee out of my hand 
uh, between the house and the car. Like I bent over to pick up my phone and then I dropped the binder I had in my hand and then I got to the car and dropped the phone on my toe and like everything was just, and as I get in the car, I think, oh my gosh, this is terrible. And I didn't, like, I feel like the message wasn't coming together and like I had this moment of like, I could walk into church this morning and just be like really grumpy and depressed. And like, I have all these reasons to be like, oh, this morning already stinks. Like, this is really unfair and unfortunate. And I could be in that place and I could easily be there. Um, and that's just like the morning, right? I mean, life is a lot more difficult than that. We, we get illnesses, we get family members who are sick. There is death, there is struggles with money. Um, look, I'm married to a farmer. We, you know, we depend on every, like the weather affects everything that happens in our lives, markets, you know, we're, our whole livelihood is out of our control completely. So we could wallow in that all the time. Like, oh, we don't know if the corn's gonna, the corn's not making enough, the corn's expensive and pigs are cheap. Like that's a bad combination in our household. Um, there's too much work to do. Uh, there's never enough time. We have two kids who go all over everywhere and do everything. And, you know, we don't ever see each other. And we could, you know, there would like, that's a struggle in life, right? Oh, I don't see my husband. How about, I don't have a husband. I don't have a wife. Why has God made me single for all this time? There's all kinds of things we can be depressed about, that we can wallow in. And here's the thing. We want to say that, like, here's sort of a piece of comfort about this, that there are people in the Bible who are in that same place. And I want to talk about a couple of those people. Um, and the first one, my home group friends, let me just give a little plug for home groups. If you're not going to a home group, you probably, you should, um, because they're, you just should, straight up, they're life-changing. But when I'm about to read this verse, and everybody in my home group is going to chuckle, because this is Katie's this is Katie's verse. This is my story in the Bible. And my home group friends know it because this is my life struggle and they do life with me. And so as soon as I start reading this, they're going to know exactly why I picked it because they're in my life with me and they know me like that. So that's my little plug that get into a home group where people will know you and know your life. Do you know what it is without looking? Did you cheat? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so speaking of Bibles, if you need a Bible, they're under the bench, they're under, they're under your seats. Um, you can get it online um, with you version. Um, and I'm going to throw you off just a little bit this morning. So the Bibles under your seats are ESV. Tom likes the ESV. Uh, Brent likes the NIV. And I decided to use the NLT this morning. So, you know, whatever. It's all God's word. Okay, so the um, verse... What I, the story I have that I'm going to start with is Mary and Martha. And uh, it's Luke 10, 38 through 42. And this is what it says. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and she said, Lord, it doesn't, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. Okay, so we all know the reason we hear this story, right? It always has the same ending. If it's a fable, it always has the same moral. But for a minute, I want to focus on Martha because Martha is my, Martha's my girl. I get Martha. I feel Martha. Um, I'm a party planner. I host people in my house all the time. And if Jesus came to town, I would be Martha. I would be in the kitchen making dinner for Jesus. And boy, would I make a dinner. It wouldn't just be like, you know, we wouldn't just have like hot dogs and potato chips. No, uh -uh, I wouldn't call for pizza. I would bring out the best for Jesus because Jesus is in my house and I would set the table and I would have the most beautiful tablescape and man, I would make some quality dessert and, and I would be busy and it would take me hours to accomplish this. And Martha obviously doesn't have a husband at the time, but her poor husband would be running around like a chicken with his head cut off too, because that's what happens. 
right? So, you've <laughs> so I would be miserable and so would he. Um, but I get Martha and I have a sister too. So I really get Martha. And I know that if my sister and I were throwing a party and I were in the kitchen doing all the work, and my sister were sitting out on the couch, I would feel very foul about my sister. I would have some unkind things to be saying about my sister, and I would say them to anyone who came near me. Yeah. <laughs> like, anybody who passed through the kitchen, I'd be like, I can't believe Libby's out there sitting and doing nothing, and I'm doing all the work, and she's getting all the glory. I'm sure everyone's telling her the food's great, and there she is just sitting there doing nothing, and I'm doing all the work. And which is, I mean, a hundred, like that, I would say that, that is exactly what I would say. <laughs> and, and I would be really bitter and mad and I would just be ugly. It would be ugly. I would be so unhappy and ugly. <laughs> and I would be wallowing in the fact that I was doing all the work and getting, doing everything. And my sister was not, and I would be miserable. I, I would be, I would be miserable and I would be making everyone around me miserable. And I imagine Martha kind of was too. And I really imagine because Martha played tattletale and went to Jesus and was like, she's not helping, make her come and help me, right? I mean, that is really what Martha did here. Um, and Jesus tells her to stop and she's in the wrong place. And we're gonna come back to that but I want to point out another sibling who kind of does the same thing, kind of wants to wallow in his own self-pity. Um, I was thinking, about, and I, this did not make the U version. It did not make the, everything had to be in by Wednesday, and I didn't come up with this till Thursday or Friday. So um, I was thinking about the prodigal son. So everybody knows the story of the prodigal son. Well, who I was really thinking about was the older brother. And I kind of identify with that older brother at times. The brother who, you know, we love the story of the prodigal son because we've all been the prodigal son. We've come back to this loving father. But have we ever identified ourselves as the older brother who says, hey, what about me? What about me? I've been here this whole time. And you're not throwing me a party. You're not saying, way to go, me. And he's once again wallowing in his self-pity. Poor me, poor me. Look at the bad things that are happening to me. You're being nice to my brother, not being nice to me. And we wallow in that. We look at that and say, God, how come you're doing good things for this person and you're not doing good things for me? Because all we're looking at are the things that are not good. It's not that God isn't doing good things for us. It's that we're stuck in that pit of all the things that we can see that are not good in that moment in time in our lives. Um, 2 Corinthians tw uh, 12, 7 through 10 is talking about, this is Paul in the midst of talking about um, visions he's had. Um, and it, I'm going somewhere with this. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from being proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecution, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For I am weak, and then I am strong. Paul, our hero of the faith, Paul, who did great things and wrote so much of what we read in the Bible, Paul had a reason to wallow. He had a lot of reasons to wallow. I mean, he was in jail. He had whatever this thorn in his flesh was. He could have wallowed in that. And he said, but I, and I asked God to take it away. Isn't that frustrating when you ask God to take something away from you and he just doesn't? What a, what a really good reason to be self-pitying. But God, I asked you to take this away. I asked you to make this better and you didn't do it the way I wanted you to. Why? Why? That's not fair. And but here's the thing, that's not where God wants us to be. He doesn't want us to be in this pit of self-pity 
And he really doesn't want us to share that with the people around us. Because, you know, like Martha, when we get in these places when things aren't going well, we tell people about it. We share our misery, right? And it feels good when people feel sorry for you, doesn't it? Doesn't that feel good? Like, oh, life so I'm so sorry you're having such a bad time. And, you know, I, I reflect on this, and, and I'm guilty of it. Um, there are some things going on in, in my work life that are challenging right now, and um, <laughs> I don't know if I complain about it all the time or not. Maybe I do, but to the point that one of my friends at work sent me flowers this week because she just felt so bad that there were so many things that I was struggling with. And it was so kind of her, but then I kind of reflected like, oh dear, am I like all, that's all you can see is this negativity in my life? I hope not. Um, You can kind of see it. You don't have to hear it from me (laughs) if you work there, but that's just a whole nother story. Um, Here's what Philippians said. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. 4.11 says, Not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. God doesn't want us to wallow in self-pity. He does not want us to be in a place where all we can see is the bad things that are happening to us. All we can feel is the negativity that we walk around with this blanket of ugliness on us. And in some ways, I think that makes us feel better because this feels, it feels like, oh, this is my stuff. This is what I carry around. And we carry it around almost like a badge of pride that I'm the busiest, I'm the most miserable, I have the hardest life. And God doesn't want that for us. In, Mary, in the story of Mary and Martha, Jesus says to her, you are worried and upset over these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. He wants us to focus on him. He wants us to be with him. He wants us to trust him. And so I had this great plan that I was going to give you three action steps to make you able to change perspective. I had great, it was really good. And then I changed my mind. Um, (laughs) Because here's the thing, it all comes down to a couple of things. And this is what I realized this morning as I was driving to church. Here's, Here's what came to me, was that I was looking down as I walked out of the house and I was looking down at all the things I dropped and my sore toe and there on the ground to remind me that I shouldn't be looking down. It was the most beautiful yellow leaf just laying there. And then I got in the car and I looked up and the trees are beautiful right now. They're orange and gorgeous and the sun is shining. The sky is blue. And in that moment, I was surrounded by God's God's beauty, God's grace, God's abundance right there in that moment because I looked up instead of down. And then I'm driving and I thought, you know, my kids and my house and all of that and what a blessing it is that I have a husband who I can walk out the door and my children are half dressed and they're a big hot mess and they'll come to church and they'll be fine because their dad is as good a parent as their mother. You know, he might be better. (laughs) except on hair. (laughs) Um, And what a blessing is that? And what a blessing it was that I got in a car that started, and even though my house didn't have heat, my car had heat. It even has seat warmers, so I took us, got warm. That was a blessing this morning. And um, here's the thing. I have a house that doesn't have heat. I have a house, and the heat will get fixed. And um, I came to church this morning to celebrate the fact that I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And, and that's huge. That's, that's big. That's a good thing, right? And so as I reflected, um, a, a story I wanted to share because part of this message came out of this place. Years and years ago, back in the days when we were not here, we were downtown having church. We used to have Bible study there and we watched this video and it was doing life together, Carrie and Scott, doing life together. And um, it's back in the, if anybody wants to see it, I'll try to find it for you sometime. But, and I have no idea what the point was. I 
really don't have any idea. But this one nugget stuck with me from this video. It was a gentleman giving his testimony, and he had been had some kind of medical illness or some kind of disease where he was in chronic pain and chronic misery all the time. And he eventually got better, but he said, in the worst of it, I realized there was nothing else I could do. And I started to, there might only be five minutes a day when I was not in pain or I was not suffering. But in those minutes, I was going to celebrate God. I was going to praise God for the moment, just the brief moments that I was not hurting. The brief moment when I was not struggling, I was going to focus on God. And that made me think about our wallowing and And how often do we instead, how would it change our perspective if in those times where things are really, really hard, and sometimes those things are so far beyond our control, we can't control when death happens to our family or friends. We can't control that. We're not in control of disease. We're not often in control of the circumstances that happen to us in our jobs, Uh, We're not in control of of so many things in our lives. And so things come to us that are beyond our control. And so it's not as easy as saying, well, I'm just going to just not do that anymore. I'm just going to be better. I'm just going to be healed. Uh, I'm just not going to grieve anymore. You can't just take those things away. But what we can do is we can start looking for the moments when God's light is shining the brightest. And not just look for them, but thank God for them, but celebrate them. Because think about how your attitude changes. Think about how my attitude changed this morning when I went from, oh, everything, I'm literally dropping everything, you know, to, wow, God is so good. Even though everything's on the ground, on the ground, there was that beautiful moment of God, that beautiful leaf. Um, we just, and here's the thing, we've got to look for God's grace and we've got to trust that it's there and that it's going to be there. Um, I want to share this story. Over the last, Steve shared something at, um, well, first of all, let me go back. The worship team, um, most of you don't know this, but if you're on the worship team, you do. Our worship team comes together on Thursday night and we, um, we practice and um, sometimes there's a really holy, great moments. And sometimes we're just a hot mess, like all over the place. And, but at the end of our worship time together, at the end of practice, we sit down together and we pray together. We pray over each other. We pray over the needs in our group. We take time to just pray together, to be together. And a couple weeks ago, Steve shared a prayer request, and I just want to share it because I think it is a change in perspective. Over the last six months, Steve is, here's, I gotta say this, Steve is, Steve is never going to come up here and, and tell you his testimony. He's never going to share his story with you, but God gives great things that happen in his life so I can get up and share them. (laughs) So that's really awesome of God. Um, So over the last six to eight months, um, I said Steve's a farmer, and he helps his dad and his two uncles farm. Um, most of you know if you're part of our, you know, you know that about us. And um, he's also in charge of our hog operation. Um, he doesn't work full-time in the hog building. Uh, he has a full-time list of things that he does most of the time. But about six to eight months ago, uh, his workforce changed. People quit. And um, we couldn't find people to hire. And so Steve had to go start working full-time in the hog building. That means leaving our house at 6. He's usually at work some days between 6.30 and 7 in the morning. And he, you know, works until the work is done because it's what you do when you're a farmer. And um, that was a big change for our family because we're used to him having a little bit more flexible schedule. He can oftentimes be there in the morning. Um, He had to work weekends, started to have to work weekends. And over the course of this time, there have been some times where there literally were not enough people. There was, during the fair, we're really committed in the summer to that. And Steve was not going to be able to be in the building. And he honestly said, I I don't know how they're going to get the work done. I don't know how it's going to happen because there are not enough people to do the work. And um, in every time, God has provided someone. Um, 
the first time, I think it was the first time, somebody who used to work for us, he called her, she didn't call back, she didn't call back, and one day she just showed up in the office and said, hey, I got your call, do you need me to work today? And yes, we do need you to work today. Okay, I can work for the next couple of weeks. God provided, got us through the fair, got, gave Steve a rest, um, gave him a chance to do some of the other commitments that he had. And I talk about worship because here's the thing. He could really be wallowing in that. And I'm not going to lie to you. There have been moments where he has. Um, but last two weeks ago at, um, at worship band practice, he said, here's the thing. I, in a week, we're going to start taking corn off. And I have to be out of the building. I have to go help take corn off. And there are not enough people to work in this building. But I trust that God <laughs> will provide someone. Something will happen. And provision will be there. And on Wednesday, somebody new started. He got an email from somebody who was the right fit and God provided. Because instead of being in that wallowing place, he said, I know that God will provide because he has every time. And I will, instead of looking down and looking at the mud and the dirt and saying, how is this going to happen? We're miserable. It's awful. I don't know what's going to happen next. He said, I'm just going to look up and I'm going to say, God, I trust that this is going to be here. And I'm going to praise you for all the times you have provided before, for all the places you have brought goodness before. And Lo and behold, God provided. Maybe the next time he won't. Maybe there'll be a lesson to learn the next time and he won't. But today he did and we're grateful. And we look up from the muck and mire and say, thank you, Lord. Because when we're looking up, there's so much out there to be grateful for. It doesn't take the mud away. I I'm not, I'm not going to say that. You know, you can... I don't want to stand up in front of you and be unrealistic and say that um, Martha you know, is in the kitchen, there are still dishes to get done. There are still, there's still that whole meal to clean up. And Mary's probably still going to sit there with Jesus and not do those dishes. But if Martha takes a minute and says, but I am in the presence of Jesus Christ. And she celebrates that, stops for a minute, spends some time with Christ then maybe those, those dishes aren't as awful. Maybe that isn't as, that isn't as awful to do. That isn't an awful thing. It isn't miserable. It isn't poor me, poor me. It's, wow, look, I'm doing Jesus's dishes. That is awesome. And look out my window as I'm doing Jesus's dishes. Look at those little children playing out there. And I get to hear their laughter. Not poor me, I'm stuck in the kitchen doing the dishes. If we think about the prodigal son, that, that son who is the brother of the prodigal son, who says, poor me, I was here, and you're throwing parties for the one who wasn't. I have done all the work. I have been here. I've been the loyal son and the hard worker, and I have stood by you this whole time, and you don't celebrate me. If he looks back, what a blessing he had all those years with his father that the other brother didn't get. What a blessing that he had relationships with his family and his loved ones that the prodigal son didn't get. And he didn't look at, and what a blessing, now he has his brother back. And maybe he won't have to do as much work. Um, you know, what a blessing those things are. But he's looking at the negative. He's wallowing in that muck and mire. And that is not where God wants us to stay. That is not what he wants for us. That's not what he wants for any one of us. So my challenge to you is this. It's twofold. One, it's as you find yourself in places, as we all do, where we just are overwhelmed by sadness or self-pity or all of those things, can you look up from that and see something to praise God for? And it might just be one minute, one day, and maybe tomorrow it'll be two minutes, and the next day it'll be three, and eventually you'll be standing next to the mud instead of standing in it or sitting in it. And it didn't necessarily go away. Just your position within it changed because God wants that for you. He wants you to come to him, to be near him, to 
let him help you. I um, told you that I'm having some struggles. And here's the reality. The chances are good they're not going to change for a while. And I was really, really depressed about that, struggling every day to want to go do the job that I love. And what suddenly came upon me was this. I may not be able to change the circumstances. I may not you know, have any control over any of them. But here's what I know. I will go every day to work and Jesus will go with me. And he will walk next to me. Whether he'll pick me up and lift me out of it, maybe that's not his plan for me right now. Maybe I have to walk through this because on the other side, there's something fantastic. But what I know is I'm not walking by myself. And if I can celebrate that, if I can say, you know what, today may stink, but Jesus walks through it with me. So it's okay, you know, because he'll give me some peace. He'll help me through it. Then that's a good day, even if it was a bad day. 